Welcome to Real People, Real Matters with Diana Tolchinsky. We're on location now with Mark J. Palmieri Studio in Des Plaines. This is Mark. We met at a drawing class. It was my first art class at Oakton Community College for a long time. He was a wonderful professor. Thank you very much. What was your earlier life in drawing and painting in, with your grandparents and parents? Any influences you had? Um, well, just as a boy, I saw my dad drawing and how he could take a napkin or a, a piece of paper and a pencil and draw like a cartoon or a character. And that was inspiring. And, and I just naturally responded to art when I went to you know, people's homes or places. And I would always ask like, who, who made that? Because I couldn't figure out how it got to be what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would usually say, no, well, no one made it. No one. That was weird to me, you know, no one made it. Because they probably bought it at a store to decorate their house. It wasn't a great, important thing. It was like a, it was a decoration. Please tell me, did you have any, like, uh, personal or private classes, like in uh, grade school or in junior high that you were fond of or? In, you know, I was part of the local public schools and mostly we did crafty things. I hope I can uh, say it in a humorous way. You know, we'd use popsicle sticks and make Abraham Lincoln's house and, mm -hmm. stuff, you know, things like that, or melt leaves with crayons and wax paper. Uh, it wasn't really directed in a traditional drawing uh, sense. It was more, it was just kind of like fun, I guess. And then, so what geared you toward like drawing instead of business or anything like that, or like personal finance, or is there any like knack that you had that was shown throughout the years? Mm. When I first, um, when, by the time I was finishing high school, I was taking some art classes, but also shop, like metal shop and things like that, where I worked with materials. I liked working with my hands and having a tangible, substantial end result. But I was also, uh, in high school, I did, I took like accounting and things like that. Oh, and I was how like, was that? it was horrible was for me <laughs> because I couldn't understand how this, at the end of the day, gave me no satisfaction. And um, when I went to, I didn't want to go to college. No. My family had, you know, the working tradition, you go to college, maybe if you're like exceptional, but there was no discussion of it because I was not exceptional. Um, and uh, you get a job. Mm -hmm. So I worked for about a year after high school and it was, you know, I liked psychology and philosophical notions and ideas and, you know, that was in the 70s. There's all these new ideas coming out, even crazy ideas like about extraterrestrials and where did life come from and, and I would talk about those things. I was also very interested in psychology and I would talk about these things at work and people would just, you know, oh. you know, just shut up, you oh. know. You know, and I felt like I was, uh, you know, they always talked about sports, their car, this, whatever. And I didn't really care too much. Um, and so I went to school um, at, um, went uh, to Harper first. And uh, I took psychology, mm -hmm. it was biological psychology. And I wanted to understand the, the mind or life, you know. I was really interested in religion too. I, I considered that, I was discouraged from yeah. going into it, you know. Um, there's a, another whole family tradition of uh, displeasure with organized religion. Um, but I would search, you know, I searched too for the meaning to life. In psychology, when I went to college, I was taking advertising, business, law enforcement, philosophy, art, and then more art. And I shifted, I kept shifting towards art because I was getting this um, encouragement. My instructor said things like, you know, oh, your work's really pretty good. Did you ever consider going to the Art Institute? And I said, what's that? Because I'd never been there. We weren't a cultural uh, family. We were more, um, like I said, my, they, you worked. You, you worked and you enjoyed life, but you, you had a job and your job was to earn money. How did you like your years in the Art Institute? Was it very challenging, steady fast of getting employment afterward? Well, my first semesters at the Art Institute were in intimidating. Uh, I went there on a college assignment the first time to do a paper about, it was about Cubism or Picasso, and I wandered from the museum into the school. 
by accident. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was a school, and so I was. What is this place? I thought they used it to work on uh, art from the museum. This is embarrassing, but it's true. So they said, no, no, this is a school, and they showed me around, and I said, I gotta. I have to go here. This is the art institute. The school. That's what they meant. The school, and. Uh, I worked very hard at developing my portfolio to get accepted, and uh, it was intimidating when I first got there as an undergraduate. Um, the first year or so, all I kept thinking was, "I get, to, I'm gonna, I just want to get out of the city, you know, I want to get out of here." I couldn't stand it. Um, but then, as, um, I got a little bit more of a system. Um, I brought my own locker. I snuck my own locker into the school. Maybe if you see all my work, you understand. I have this, like, I, you know, I have to always. I have a million things. So uh, I brought my own locker and I snuck it in there, a huge locker, so I could keep all my materials. I didn't have to carry everything home. I didn't have to put it in this little locker. And I kind of made it a second home. So I was there early in the morning till well after the classes ended. And uh, yeah, my, my um, undergraduate years were really, I'll say they were exciting. There were people there from all over the world and uh, the graduate and undergraduate students mixed very freely. Um, so I got to see just the most am amazing, uh, fresh art from artists from all different places in the world. Um, what were your career counseling in the art institute? Did they suggest going to graduate school or going into the fine arts? How was it in the art institute back then? Well, when I, gradu when I got my BFA, I had gallery opportunities. Like mm -hmm. galleries will kind of check out what's going at the sc out at school. And so I had some exhibition opportunities and some sales through galleries, which was nice. But I didn't really, I felt like I was just going back into being in business again, making the work that was popular that would sell. I wanted to make new work. I didn't know there were, I didn't, I'm, when I, I didn't know what graduate school was. Okay, so maybe this, this will be a good thing for somebody to hear. I was almost ready to graduate. I didn't even know it. They said, are you going to graduate? And I said, what, from what? And they said, you get your BFA. And I said, I, no, I wanted to go to school more. They said, no, well, you can't be part of the, graduate, the program. You should apply for graduate school. And that's what my dad said. What are you going to do? Go to school for the rest of your yes. life? Yes. And uh, so it was kind of like either... Um, you get into graduate school and no pussyfooting around like, but well, I'm going to wait. And I applied for graduate school and uh, apparently my hard work as undergraduate paid off because, you know, they asked for 20 slides mm -hmm. and I gave them 120 wow. of works that I had done recently. The professors, I had the top people in the department were my professors and they wrote me letter of recommendation. I got in and I got a full scholarship. That was a big deal. So that meant I could concentrate on my schoolwork, and I, and I work part-time, but um, it was a big deal to me. And it's what I wanted. I wanted to continue my education. Um, and even later when I taught, the reason I did choose to teach, because I'd be in an, an academic environment and still have an opportunity to learn and grow. Did you ever counsel like students at like the Art Institute that it had to be held back or like they had to change concentrations. How was it psychologically to change a young person's, I guess, uh, future? It, it, it isn't, it's never really been so much that. If their heart is set on something and they're putting themselves into it, you really have to go all out and, and just do it. And uh, the, the biggest counsel is a form of like chastisement like you are just wasting your time mm -hmm. okay there's no excuse that like romantic notion of an artist's lifestyle or as one of my professors called it you know you're just a Sunday painter you know you paint when you feel like it and you're you're playing around it doesn't work there's no way to guarantee your success in what you're doing I can't guarantee it but I can guarantee your failure if you keep doing this you're not going to amount to anything Okay, it's still a gamble no matter what, but this isn't going to work. Do you have any tips for high schools trying to go into art therapy or to become curators or anything like that when they start young like that? If, if you have access to early college programs, either at the Art Institute or anything at a college or um, even like, for example, um, non-credit programs, mm -hmm. uh, early college placement at Oakton Community College, get started early and get the foundational traditional things established 
then you can go off and you do at some point you have to decide if you're if you're going into a creative venue or sort of just um like a, i don't want to just call it a production venue but you're a producer in the field and you enjoy doing what you do or you're the one who's gonna like shoot the dice make the work you want to make and uh sink or swim go with it oh that's very risky do you have any advice for parents trying to look for a value in state versus college or is it, is it articulation program is it two plus two or I, I no don't you don't whatever you do you got to put your hand to it and uh you know again 70s i grew up a lot of my friends went off into goofy behave you know uh, just bad stuff and even now with young people when i see them having a, a let's just call it um progressive disorder I will just ask them what's going on. Are you like out partying with your friends? Are you on something? Are you what's going on? And and I have sometimes students that are exceptionally talented and promising, and hopefully they'll get to that wake up day okay. where they wake up and they say what I just said. You're going to have to work a lot harder and concentrate and let all that other stuff go. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. I had a wake up day. I remember it. I was out in the middle of like almost nowhere in Indiana. I said. I gotta really work at this a lot harder. And that, after that, I just worked at it a lot harder. Do you see any moms or seniors just trying to like make artwork as a hobby? Do you see like making, I guess like crafts for, I guess for seniors or for like young moms as like a hobby or possibly an entrepreneurship? Do you ever see that? I do see some. I think that happens more towards, you know, some of the ceramicists make things. There's a consistency in what they make and they can develop a series. Uh, the way I teach in painting, uh, especially, is the way I was taught. Mm -hmm. it, there's a risk taking. There could be some series work. The goal, I can never make work with a goal of selling it or it being a, an item. Um, as far as uh, it being a craft or a hobby, it can be fulfilling and um, you know, therapeutic in that yeah. sense, cathartic, and all these wonderful things that we, uh, words we used to describe. Um, but at some point, like a, like a writer who is writing a story or, 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 or writing a, a, a play or a script, you know, for, for a movie, there's something more to it. It's, it's an adventure on the part of the creator, certainly, to see what's going to come out of it. Um, but it's not like a formula. No. There's got to be like a risk in it. So the, the real question is, um, they use the word empowers. It empowers people. Knowledge empowers people. Yes. And we'll just, yes. you know, I, I like to think of it like that. And um, do you have any favorite painters like Degas or Suzanne that you're in memory of? Or? Well, today I was looking at Yves Tangyi. If it, I, you know, we never get their names right, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, uh, you know, I've had Van Gogh, Van Hock, Van Huch, you know, Vincent, um, always uh, Vincent Van Gogh, Yves Tangy. Uh, if you could deal with the lives of somebody like Salvador Dali, based on his amazing artwork, and, and Rene Magritte, um, as time goes on, you know, you go to different places, even like Jackson Pollock, and uh, um, wonder about the things that led them to the visions that they discovered. But I could like name artists. I'll just keep naming artists. Lucian Freud. Oh, we were looking at today, Lucian Freud today with students and just amazing figurative uh, work. Um, honestly, I have a hard time narrowing it down. I remember Cezanne picked up the photography at the Kodak in 1900s. It was the first one, yes. Well, yeah, We again, this is what we talk about. Photography as it relates to, um, mainly I'll just say the painting, it's very important. Um, when photography got to be a like real practical mm -hmm. um, format, of m mostly documentation, uh, some people said, you know, that's it. You know, we don't need painting anymore. Um, but it, actually what it did was it freed painters up to pursue a wider range of visions and interests. Oh. And that happened again, like when filmmaking got to be a working formula people some people said theater is dead now we're never gonna no one's gonna want to see a bunch of actors on stage and variables happening um, when we can have a common experience but um, film opened up 
considerations for art and dimensionality and movement in art. And uh, again, it opened another door. The next point probably is like the technology and computer age. It was like a big wall, you know, and a lot of painters that I studied under professors were like, well, I don't even know if painting could persist. Is your art in any open galleries or have, how's your routine of showing and displaying your galleries? After From time to time I have gallery representation, but it hasn't been for quite some time with a real contract. Uh, right now I rent work out to a few places, uh, to one location we'll say, and they um, are good enough to actually pay and, and uh, not give me any, there's no trouble, it's just, it's just nice. The gallery representation thing, I'm not a much of a businessman, mm -hmm. and that was always hard for me. I blew a lot of opportunities because I just, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with the business part. I mean, do you have any stories of where, like, that red dot will be displayed in the high and the evening when it's, it's displayed and it's not there, or do you have any stories about that? In terms that? of selling work? Selling work. You know, it's weird a lot of the work that i sold a lot of it was bought by gallery owners in mm -hmm. chicago um and other artists there's a real like in chicago at least there's this kind of gap between artists go to see art shows and you know that whole thing and there's very there, there's there's not enough people are generally genuinely just interested in art as they uh, to purchase and own and appreciate the art mm -hmm. um that's just the that's just the way that it is I'm thankful that over the years that I've been able to do what I've done, I've been able to do it having employment in a way that was related to the, my greatest area of interest and be able to do the work that I wanted to do. I felt I have an intuitive vision about what I want to do typically, and I've been able to do it without feeling um, directed by other sources. That's how, that's how I'd say. Do you counsel anyone to be a starving artist and then a full-time artist from the weekend, or how well, do you approach yeah. your family? Well, I'm whatever. I'm whatever, the oldest one now, so I don't have to approach anyone. I have a job that's important. Mm -hmm. Artists have to have, like whether they're in theater or whatever, they typically have another job. You know, that's how we are. Um, occasionally, we're fortunate enough to have a teaching position that's not um, draining. You know, yes. so you have to have some kind of a trade or craft or employment or something in order to work and make your work. And, and, and regardless, it you know, it's a sacrifice, undoubtedly. And there's a degree of, again, the word is, it's selfishness. Yes. You, you have to be able to like shut out everything in order to make the work. If you don't make the work, it won't amount to anything. If you make the work, it might not amount to anything, but it, you know, it's that same formula again. I can't guarantee this will ever amount to anything except if I don't see it through. Yes. So you have to, yeah, you have to have some way of making a living undoubtedly. Who introduced you to Oakton Community College? I, um, I was a student at Oakton. I was there before they had their real campus. They were in some warehouses in the late 70s. And uh, I was one of the first students at the new campus locations. And this meant I could uh, work at my dad for my dad, my family business, and go to school. It was kind of nice. And uh, I got introduced to Oakton by probably advertising. I'm, I'm just a fall back on the naive guy again who never, never really knew too much. I went to Harper because I heard of Harper. It's not even in my district. You know, that's why I went there and somebody said to me, did you know that Oakton's in your district and it's like a different, you know, financial a, a cost than per credit hour? No, I didn't know that. How did this art um, help you with the psychology of the mind or was it therapy or were you struggling with anything? Yeah, it was. Yeah, definitely. It's a re it's a release. It's kind of like a it's not it's not just a release. At first, it's kind of like a like if you were in a wrestling or you wrestle with somebody, you're like you wrestle, you, you got hold of them, and then you you got hold of the air, and then you're kind of wrestling, and it's wrestling back against you. At some point, it, I do think there's a true thing. It's, we'll call it like an intuitive nature of the work itself that comes out, and you have to learn to just get it to that point, um, and then stop. Stop. Yeah, and then stop. 
uh, I don't know where the ideas come from, mm -hmm. but I think they come from better places than just our own mechanical like process. The daily functional. Yeah, daily. it comes from some almost like dreams. There's a, a subconscious, intuitive, spiritual realm, mm -hmm. and. Uh, when I tell people this, I'm a creationist. I was an evolutionist and an empiricist, but I became a creationist and a man of faith. You know, I'm a Christian man who oh, nice. that opened it up for me because in, in the late in the late '90s, I went I got into a pretty big depression. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of artists, like in this, they have this mental struggle and emotional struggle. I found life to be kind of meaningless. You try to get as much stuff and make as much money, and then for what? Um, and we're just this like dot spinning around in space for no reason by chance. Uh, that's what I was taught in the public schools. But then people were witnessing me and telling me that there's more there and you have to re-examine these things. And as I re-examined the creationist perspective, like the ideal ideology that, you know, how can something come from nothing? But that's what you believe. It came from nothing for no reason, randomly, and that life itself generated from non-living matter, that's not scientific. Mm -hmm. Why do you accept that? And I would be, become angry and say, well, of course that's true. Um, when I went through the steps that I went in my faith, it opened up the um, doors of much greater possibilities. And even this thing that, um, like Picasso said, he wanted to be able to paint and create like a child yes. and have that freedom to create. I think maybe that is part of what he was speaking of in his own way, um, that you could create and paint and take enjoyment and color and all these things. And uh, ideally that does extend to others. Would you want to be a sculptor and art therapist? Do you have any look back saying that I would be a great psychologist for people or with your artwork that's through the roof? Um, well, my work in the sculptural sense is more, mostly like, is more formal and structural. It's not in a traditional sense about three dimension and, and let's say like Michelangelo's David or you know it's a standing form. We recognize it from all sides as being this. My work tends to run more towards geometric. I like, I really have always liked color. Um, the art therapy, as for myself, I think I do a little bit of it all the time at Oakton with students there. You know, they express some of the things they're going through. And and um, I'll go back to the thing, if you don't do it, nothing's going to happen. I can't guarantee anything. But um, it, it is, therapeutic makes it always sound like there's something wrong that has to be addressed. It's more like calisthenic, I'd say. You know, a functioning your, your spirit, your mind, and your creativity, keeping it alive. So that's how, I don't, I don't think I would ever be suitable in a really um, strict sense being in a, as an art therapist. Yeah. Do you have any stories about the Louvre or any countries that you visited in the museums? Not too many. <laughs> I haven't got around too much. I always, you know, one of my weak points is I do, I'm like a home person. Yes. Uh, I, I like rural areas, more like Indiana, Michigan, but I also like people. Working at Oakton has been amazing. As a child, I did dream of traveling the world. I had to dream of walking around the world as much as possible, maybe unrealistic with the consideration for trouble in the world, but um, I didn't get that. But I did get to go to Art Institute and meet people from all over the world. And then later when I worked at Oakton, I met, again, people from all over the world. So that was the thing I did. I did get, that is what influenced me greatly. Do you have any favorite memories of um, either Oakton faculty or the Art Institute? Any favorite mentors or professors that you attribute your success in? Well, mostly at, at, at Oakton was my professor, James Krauss, because he, the guy, he could do anything. Painting, drawing, 3D. Um, 2D, uh, mm -hmm. anything he put his hand to, demonstrate it, show you how to do it the first time. Uh, he's an artist and a craftsman. And uh, like I said, uh, when I went to Art Institute, I said earlier when we were talking, they asked me, well, where did you learn how to make stretcher bars, prepared panels, work with plaster? And I said, well, at, at Oakland Community College for my professor. But also at the Art Institute, uh, uh, former professor Ray Yoshida, and uh, Michiko Tatani, 
and uh, I'd, I'd be wrong not to remember also uh, Theodore Halkin. Do you keep into contact with any art institute students that you taught yeah. over the years? Some. Through Facebook, you know, Facebook. The, the new phenomena, something no one I would have thought of when I was much younger. But um, yeah, there's some. And some of them are actually um, doing something with their work. We do get to show and share. Occasionally get an invitation to participate in a retrospective show. How important is social media trying to broadcast your artwork? Or have you ever mentioned that to students, social media and... Social media, I'm learning about. I'm slow on the uptake. Every time I start to get a handle on something, it changes enough that it takes me, you know, whatever. Honestly, it takes me a lot. I'm like, okay, I remember I did this last time. It doesn't work. They, they explained there was an update. Students, I, you know, this could be a whole thing. I don't know how legitimate it all is. It seems like it's kind of like fruiting, stuff, dispersing it into nothingness in a way. Um, I don't, I don't know what it's gonna. I don't know what's gonna happen with all of it. Yeah, that's, um, this is how I show my work in what's called a, a salon style. Things are arranged even with the consideration for the shapes of the various pieces to one another and the colors in each one. Uh, most of my work is highly constructed, made with wood and various other materials. Um, this is one of the later pieces from sometime last year, and it's the influence of it's Chicago Imagist ideas of floating shapes. Uh, they have a psychological implications and maybe a separation, even like of a loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, I like to use, as I said, you know, not just the shape of a, um, a support, in which case most of my works are on wood, okay. um, but also projecting out from the wall into a, uh, so it actually projects into the space. Some of my pieces are set up specifically so the light, as the light changes in the day, the shadow and the reference points on the work change. This is very contemporary, it's very nice. It's, it's contemporary, shadows. yeah, it's meant, uh, like for example, to be uh, arranged in a format of like a outdoor park venue at some time, as maybe some of the other pieces are in here. Um, I see them not just being as a wall hanging piece, but a, an installation or an outdoor park with three dimensional elements um, sticking up and you know people could walk around through there. Um, so tell me about this piece. Is it, is it a faces or a facade of people? Or? Well, we talked about catharsis or even like art therapy, we'll call it that. Um, I did this after one of the times I, I was had a really hard time. And, and, and um, each day I would do 36 paintings. Each one of these is a small painting. Uh, I made the tiles and I'd paint them. And they were like, kind of like ejecting out of me, these sort of like characters that were inside almost like they were a lot of them were bad it was called friends monsters and weirdos which oh, was a series nice. i had did so every day i would do 36 paintings and is this um asian art inspired or not necessarily it's more like of a geometric configuration not unlike the piece over there in the corner that was a, like a design for a tabletop mm -hmm. It was both the design for a tabletop and um, I used a variety of different, I made my own paints, uh -huh. you know, with glue or xylol or other materials, uh, encaustic. So while some of my paintings are, are oil, some are also acrylic or hot wax or styrene or enamel. Thank you, Mark. I love your philosophy and theology about artwork and how great of a professor you are. Thank you very much for coming to see my uh, studio gallery. And uh, the things I have to say <laughs> are just things I have to say, but most of all, I hope you have a chance to see some of the work and that it speaks for itself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Palmieri, for a wonderful discussion about art and philosophy. This is Real People, Real Matters with Diana Solchinsky. Thank you again for watching our show.